Hello everyone, so a day of turbulent emotions is behind us basically. <laughs> I mean wow, it was quite something. In the first round of the Olympiad we were paired with Norway, the third seed. The third seed, Norway. 2022 Olympiad, wow, what a, what a start to that. And uh, yeah, we were excited, maybe our board one would get to play against Magnus Carlsen, our board one is an up and coming player, Gio Kalust. Um, yeah, but it didn't happen. Magnus sat this one out, which was a bit disappointing. So the day started with some disappointments. <laughs> um, but yeah, it ended with a very big disappointment. And, and I'm kind of spoiling the result right now. But uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it was tough to watch. I, uh, I took a small break, did some other work. Uh, I mean, I wanted to record this video two hours ago. So uh, yeah, but I wasn't, I wasn't in the mood after what I saw. So... <laughs> So I took a bit of a break, worked on some other stuff, and uh, yeah, now I'm recording this video. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, what to say? Let's just start off with the games. <laughs> so Gio Calust was playing against uh, none other than Aryan Tari, big, big player, up and coming as well, quite young. And uh, yeah, let's see how this game went. So um, a little bit of a side note. Uh, Gio Calust plays the Catlin as we will see and he prepared some lines against Aryan but Aryan deviated. So let's see, d4, knight f6, c4, e6, g3 signifying the intention to go for the Catalan, d5 and now bishop g2, Catalano is upon us. d takes c4, this is known as the open Catalan because black here accepts the sacrificed pawn which can be recovered in many ways, of course, and we'll see how white proceeds here. Knight f3, standard developing move, not much to say. And now knight c6. This is a bit of a gambity style uh, system. There are many other options here. There are There is a6, c5, bishop b4 check. All of these are possibilities and have been played and have been tried. Knight c6 is a bit more dynamic and offers some winning chances, basically. Uh, castle standard move, but there's this queen a4, uh, which is much more often played and probably the better move, more accurate. The intention is just to recover the pawn immediately and maybe apply some pressure with knight e5 and bishop uh, takes e6, because the queen of course is spinning Mr. King. Okay, but castles uh, instead, it's reasonable of course. And now rook b8, I like this move because, uh, well, first of all you're getting out of this long diagonal, and you're preparing b5 to cement the c4 pawn. So always here, as we will see in this opening, white is trying to regain the pawn and get a better position, because of course when they regain the pawn they're no longer down material, and they have uh, the very powerful Catalan bishop, this guy here is so strong. Um, so that's what white is trying to do, black on the other hand is trying to keep the pawn um, the best way they can. And now here g went for a4, which is slightly inaccurate I believe, I talked to some uh, Catalan theorem theoreticians, shout out to you, Dr. 1000IQ, who's Akram Khudr, who's playing also in the in this event, but uh, he's board 5, so he didn't get to play this one. Um, he sat this one out. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, he, uh, he doesn't like a4, and I don't either. a4 is a bit questionable, and we'll see why in a second. Um, the more standard move is e3. And after b5, e3 just cements, of course, the d4 pawn. Um, yeah, and after b5, trying to keep the pawn, now you have this very interesting sacrifice, b3. The engine takes a long time to understand the sacrifice. And uh, yeah, basically after c takes, a takes, you get these, uh, well, one, uh, well, two semi-open files. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's quite an interesting position for white. You've sacrificed the pawn, but you have like this Benko style, and speaking of the Benko, we'll take a look at the Benko game today as well. This Benko style um, um, uh, semi-open files. So a4 instead, preventing b5 outright, but the problem here is that there's b6. And this is probably the best move in my opinion. Not sure what uh, theory currently says. I think it's the second most popularly played move. Um, I don't know what theory says. Uh, now it could be, of course, like secondly most played, but uh, second most popular. But um, it could be theoretically the best. But anyway, um, yeah. Th so the point here is that you play bishop a6, and it's very difficult to recover the pawn alongside knight a5. 
it becomes almost an impossible task to recover the pawn. Play around a bit with the engine, with the, uh, like check out these lines. Uh, yeah, it's, it's quite difficult to recover the pawn. And thus black will have an advantage. Instead there's a6, which is the most popular move. And uh, yeah, after a6, you play a5, trying to prevent b5 because of en passant. But now comes bishop b4, and black will take the a pawn. White will recover the c pawn though, after, like, for example, you can play queen a4 now. But yeah, this trade probably favors uh, black, because this a pawn now allows the queen side to start rolling with uh, the a and b pawns. So yeah, that's one thing to consider. Instead, Aryan played knight a5 which is slightly inaccurate because of knight bd2 and after b6 which is also accurate again because of these ideas it's very important to develop your light square bishop as such um, yeah here geo had knight e5 very very powerful move and a very interesting pawn sacrifice this is actually quite common in the catalan sacrificing the d4 pawn because you get a lot of compensation in other ways it might not seem clear how you're getting the compensation right now but of course i'll explain in a second instead g1 for queen c2 which was yeah a bit uh, questionable the reason is the game continuation which we'll take a look at so let's go back to knight e5 here comes um well bishop b7 is one possibility and after taking uh, rook takes at knight takes e4, here white should just have an advantage. They have a nice center, and okay, maybe the light squares are a bit weak, but of course there are no light squared bishops on the board, so this is not a problem. So white should have a reasonable advantage here, or well, a slight advantage. <laughs> after queen takes d4, so uh, the most critical move, now comes knight d takes e4, making use of the standard tactic, of course, um, here that you can take the queen for free. So the queen has to recapture, takes, and now takes. And now here comes an interesting line. Capturing like this would lead to bishop b7, which would just lead to an equal position. These bishops are going to liquidate, they're going to um, take a hike off the board. So yeah, that means that white won't be left with the kind of the imbalances that give him or give them the advantage. In contrast, um, if you go bishop c6 check first and after bishop d7 which is basically forced taking and here comes takes king e7 and now bishop b5 um, so all a very standard first line now here white has the bishop pair and retains also the very strong catalan bishop which is now to add to boot it's unopposed so there is no counterpart uh, uh, light squared bishop that could uh, stop this bishop so that's uh, that's very important. Um, uh, yeah, so knight e5 was a missed opportunity. Instead, geo played queen c2. And now after bishop b7, it, um, it becomes a bit difficult for geo because the this light squared bishop is even getting stronger than this bishop because this bishop is blocked. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the knight is protecting c4. It's seeming quite difficult to recover the pawn. And your center is a bit under attack. So here Geo played e4, which further weakens the d4 pawn and doesn't really achieve much. I know it's natural to take control of the center, but e3 is always the better move in the Catalan. Well, not always, but usually <laughs> the better move in the Catalan because uh, you do um, you do take care of this uh, of the weak d4 pawn or potentially weak d4 pawn. Instead he, played uh, he, instead he played e4, and now bishop e7, Aryan played. Here it was quite surprising not to see knight b3, which uh, many people in the Lebanese WhatsApp groups were saying, like, why didn't he play knight b3? Um, yeah, after knight b3, here uh, g would be forced to take, and after bishop takes, this central pawn is going to become quite a target, and uh, black has the bishop pair, and uh, even like arguably the more active bishop so there's not much going on here and black is just better um yeah i don't know maybe Aryan like didn't fully appreciate this or th thought that there was no need to punish it immediately so he played bishop e7 and to be honest he's quite right there's like no immediate uh, good move for white that would change the character of the position so severely that it would be uh, it would be important to play uh, knight b3 immediately 
Here Geo found the best move though and played rook d1, lining up the rook with this queen and this will become actually quite relevant at some other points. And now Aryan played knight b3, arguably a bit mistimed. Here even better was c5, which is crazy, I know, because Geo just put the rook on d1 to <laughs> line up with the black queen. And now, yeah, you have c5, just open up the d file, thank you very much. And that's what black does. But now comes queen c7. What? What's going on? The point here is that white basically has no good move. Like this, like the key to this position is this knight. This knight can't move, right? Um, if ever you take, there's always taking here. And the four pawn is much more important than the c pawn. And uh, yeah, so this knight is, uh, is quite bad. And uh, it's blocking in this bishop. And this bishop blocks in this rook. So it's kind of a chain reaction. And yeah, it's not, it's not very pleasant. So c takes b6. Queen takes b6. So c takes b6 is basically fourth. Queen takes b6. And now, like, the deep point here is that, okay, now you can try to take on c4 because you're attacking the queen, so this is no longer such a big issue. But now comes the crazy queen b3. <laughs> the point here is that you can't take because you lose the queen, and otherwise you can't move because you lose the knight. And this creates a very awkward situation where you're forced to take, and after taking, here comes this fork, which is a very important motif in these positions, and one that actually happened in the game. And then e4 will fall and white's position just crumbles. Also, there's this rook bearing down on the b5. So c5 here is a move that would probably get Arientari uh, banned for engine assistance. <laughs> like, I mean, who's who's playing that? Whoops. <laughs> who's playing that uh, as, as black? Yeah, but okay. The engine finds it interesting. Knight b3 is, of course, completely fine. Um, and gives uh, black a small edge. And now came rook a2. Which is unfortunately the wrong idea. The key here, why do you want to play rook b1? Um, of course, like you only have these two squares, so why would you want to play rook b1? The key idea here is that you want this rook to remain very powerful on this square and this rook to remain, uh, I mean square, I, I mean file, uh, to remain very powerful on this file. So that's the key here. So let's take a look at one line. Here, Black should take, of course, because you're basically threatening to take or to take, actually. So takes, takes, and now after castles, let's say, you have knight e5. With the idea that these two rooks are very powerfully uh, attacking the c and d files, and you can ha play something like knight takes c4, knight c6, d5, etc. So very good position for white, actually. Well, actually, well, it's not a very good position, but like, it becomes reasonable. Um, yeah, I think maybe black has a small edge, but yeah, <laughs> way better than rook a2, which is unfortunately rather questionable, because the rook here is liable to a lot of uh, tactics, and actually in the game, knight b4 was very annoying. The queen wasn't on c2, so it wasn't a fork, but knight b4 attacking the rook on a2 was very annoying in the game, and so we'll take a look at that in just a few. Okay, so castles instead, and now e5 was played so castles wasn't probably the best move instead Aryan should have been more forcing but in this game I have noticed like he isn't forcing matters maybe he's afraid that if he forces matters too much it will like maybe lead to a drawn end game or something like that and he definitely doesn't want to draw um, but yeah he, so he wasn't doing that instead but here knight takes c1 was quite good because after rook takes c1 and castles here, if, for example, knight e5, you just take on d4. So we saw knight e5 in the uh, rook a1, rook c1, rook d1 line. And that line, it wouldn't have worked, of course, because the rooks were on the c and d files, so the queen can't really take. But in this line, it does. So knight e5 would be a bad move. And after castles, queen takes c4, which is a good move, but unfortunately, it doesn't save much, because black remains better. Um, actually, I forgot to add here... Uh, the annotations. So black is better here. Um, yeah, just making sure everything is working. Okay. So, uh, oh wait. <laughs> Knight takes c1, rook takes c1, castles. And now queen takes c4. This is the best move. But after c5, black retains a good advantage because the rook is coming to the c file and the queen is bearing down on this knight. So this knight can't move, for example. Some pressure on e4. This rook is awkward, this queen is awkward if uh, ever the c-file opens and it will open. So all of this is good for black. 
Instead here, don't be greedy and take here because after takes takes, now comes the very powerful knight e5, intending to trade off the light squared bishops. And after that, there's knight c6 with a with a fork on b8, d8, and uh, e7, and the knight on c6 would be on a very very good spot. So, the knight takes c1 was a better move and more forcing. Instead, Aryan castled, and here you found the best move with e5, just getting rid of this headache of uh, the pawn being uh, weak on e4. Now came knight d5, very natural, and now queen takes c4. Um, which I've labeled yeah, as a slight inaccuracy, but I haven't analyzed this. So I, I would imagine the reason here is simply you can you can take I guess because after knight b4 you have this so I wonder whoops <laughs> um, so I wonder if that's the move let me turn on the engine yeah so it's knight takes c4 yeah which uh, which geo unfortunately missed. So queen takes e4 is a bit less accurate because now there is this knight a5 idea and after queen e2, bishop a6 attacking uh, um, attacking the queen with a very nifty idea actually of uh, what is it here, knight b4 right? Ah b5 No not b5 Um, so here, why can't we just take knight b4? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what am I talking about, guys? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's not knight b4, of course. I I mentioned that, right? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> like w when I'm analyzing, I need to have all of my notes in front of me because if I start thinking and talking, it doesn't end well, as as we have seen just right now. <laughs> all right. So uh, yeah, bishop a6, queen e4, um, and now c5 and the position opens up again the key here is the bad knight on d2 which is blocking in the c1 bishop and the knight can't ever really move from d2 because then knight b3 would come so it has a job there and yeah here you open up the again the same plans you open up the d file you have rook c8 bishop c5 bishop b7 getting these two very powerful bishops um i don't know why i include the h3 here just to see i mean what happens but yeah so this would be um this would be quite good for uh, for black had he played knight a5 after queen takes c4 so to recap queen takes c4 was a bit of a questionable move instead he should have played knight takes c4 um but uh, yeah and after he played queen takes c4 Aryan didn't find the best move with knight a5 instead he went knight takes c1 which isn't the best move but it's reasonable here geo took with the queen there was this crazy idea of playing rook a1 because the knight is trapped. So you improve the position of the rook. For example, after knight a2, you don't take with the rook because then you're uh, repositioning your rook on a2 where it turns out it's a bad square, right? You, so you don't do that. Instead, you take with the queen. Because the queen anyway isn't so happy being on the c file, especially with c5, rook c8 coming. And now you can maybe relocate to b1 or something. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's the lesser of two evils. Uh, instead of rook takes a2 so rook a1 was very interesting <laughs> and knight a2 is a funny counter sack I'm, uh, I'm in desperado since you're losing the knight just try to annoy white a bit to misplace one piece which will take on a2 very very cute but yeah queen takes c1 there's nothing wrong with this and now rook c8 which is a very natural move intending to play c5 open up uh, the, the c file and uh, since the rook is lined up against the queen that's very natural um, but instead here playing c5 immediately was probably even better the reason is that you bring rook c8 with tempo um, so rook c8 here so now like white has more options for example knight c4 would be an interesting option intending to uh, go to d6 for example if c5 is played um, I'm, I'm not sure if it works immediately, but yeah, and uh, well, you have 93 ideas and all of that good stuff. At least you're relocating to better square, uh, better square, and you can always, for example, play b3 to uh, better protect the knight. Um, 
Instead, he went for knight b3, which I don't fault at all. Very natural move. Uh, at least attacks the c5 square. So all good. And now c5 came, which is, uh, yeah, of course, a fine move. I gave it an interesting mark because there may have been something even better, but it's completely fine. D takes c5, b, b takes c5, and now a big blunder by Geo, which doesn't make him lose the game immediately. I mean, the position becomes lost, but actually Aryan counter blunders at some later point. Um, so he played knight fd2. Very natural as well, opening up for the bishop. The problem is the tactics after knight b4 um, don't really work, which is something that actually only leads to a slight advantage. Actually, the best move was c4. So instead here, he should have played knight bd2, getting out of the, these c4 shenanigans. So here, knight fd2, now the move Aryan missed is c4. The point being after knight a1, knight b4 is just winning. Hello, hello. Super weak squares, no need to analyze this. And same thing for knight d4. Knight b4 is just, well, winning on the spot, basically. So uh, c4 is a very natural and somewhat of an easy move, to be honest, connected with knight b4. Rather surprising, uh, Aryan didn't play it. Maybe he was afraid of like trading off these two light square bishops. I don't know, but uh, yeah. Um, wait, just let me check something. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so he played knight b4 immediately instead, and now bishop takes b7 is a very good move. And now we enter into a fourth sequence, queen b1 and rook c7. Here rook b8 was even stronger because you apply pressure to the b file, but there's... Uh, rook c7 is kind of misplaced here, like, what's the rook really doing here? But, nah, okay, it's fine. Um, so, bishop e4 back, rook d7, and now some repetition, but of course, knight b4 refusing the draw. And here, uh, black is still better, but not winning. White has some compensation for the exchange with these very powerful squares. And remember, it's these opposite colored bishops, so... The advantage here is that white has some very nice light squares to work with because opposite guard bishops mean um, the light squares, um, in this case, aren't being protected well. So bishop takes h7 check here. I don't really like this. I would prefer like maybe even knight c4, which would kind of be questionable because you don't want to trade off the rook. Because when you have like two rooks against one rook, well, as in an exchange situation where you have two rooks against a rook and minor piece, for example, you don't want to trade off the one of the rooks because then you'd be left with less pieces of the same type. So in a sense, there's this concept of piece redundancy in, uh, um, in piece values and uh, chess and uh, activity material. <laughs> Keep saying words. Okay, so uh, the concept is redundancy. So when you have two rooks, they perform the same functions. So you don't mind losing one of those one of them so the kind of concept of the superfluous piece but uh, when you have one rook and like one knight you don't want to lose the rook because then you wouldn't have any rook any uh, rook any piece that can move horizontally like a rook for example so you'd be left with a piece less pe one less piece of the same type so that's uh, that's something important to know about so here like knight c4 would be kind of breaking that principle because after rook d7 you probably trade and then black would be left with their own rook but I prefer that over this, and maybe even something like rook f1, which, is, which was the best move at some other point in the game. Maybe that could have been an option as well. Instead he took on h7, and now played knight c4. And now he played rook e1. Wisely avoiding the trade, again, you don't want to trade here, because of what I mentioned about redundancy and the pieces of the same type. But he went to the wrong square, because this just allows knight d3 with a tempo on the rook, and perhaps Gio here failed to realize that the coming tactic, after like you move the rook for example, or move it to f1, there's just g6 and this bishop is lost, and already you're down in exchange, so losing one further uh, minor piece is not good, so you just completely lose it. So uh, let's go back here, instead here he should have just went for, uh, um, he should have just gone for uh, rook f1, which uh, at least... Uh, at least doesn't run into this knight d3 idea, cutting off also the connection, by the way, if I forgot to mention that. So rook e1, knight d3, and now 
rook d1 just blunders probably bishop takes d3 rook takes d3 at least this is a fighting chance i don't think white uh, black is immediately winning here white still has some reasonable compensation um a pawn and some very powerful knights versus like this bishop so some reasonable compensation instead geo just blundered and gave away the piece and yeah here this is all over no need to, dis to discuss this so a disappointing game but the way it started it was like we both uh, we both <laughs> we uh, mo most of us thought like this game was already lost from the beginning so we weren't putting too many expectations on this game and now <laughs> for the game we were putting too many expectations on well maybe the second game we're putting too many expectations on the game by the legend Amr Jewish shout out to him he runs a youtube channel also in arabic not active currently but hope he gets back to it um yeah here <laughs> Amr basically had a draw it was quite difficult of course there were always always chances for uh, Hammer to outplay, outplay him, and this is what happened, spoiler alert. But yeah, he had good chances for a draw, so it was rather disappointing, this game. Okay, let's take a look at it. d4, knight f6, c4, g6, g3, bishop g7. What's up with that? Well, it's king's Indian defense time. Think at a variation, um, and here Amr goes for a somewhat meek variation with c5. It's probably technically the best move, but playing knight c6 here offers much more dynamism. This is a line actually I play when I play the king's Indian defense, which is somewhat rare, but sometimes I'm transposed to it from another opening. Um, anyway, <laughs> castles a6, and now you have this rook b8, b5 plan, which is all very interesting and very dynamic, and yeah, something to fight for an edge as black, or at least an interesting game. Instead, c5 here just liquidates a lot and yeah this is uh, a very tradey move which is very like of course this is what Amr should go for now he's playing the king's indian defense maybe more so because that's the usual opening he plays and understands really well like he didn't want to go for some slav or something where okay maybe you have like theoretically more drawing chances but if you don't know it and like you're playing against hammer you're not going to achieve much so he played the king's indian defense in hopes of um um, and played this line specifically in hopes of getting a draw and as black against hammer a 2650 plus player that's what you should do especially when you're in team event so um yeah c5 great decision by armor to be honest but uh, if you want to be crazy you can play knight c6 <laughs> castles knight c6 and now takes takes bishop e3 attacking the spawn bishop e6 counter attacking the spawn so a funny situation here we have basically <laughs> symmetry here so it's quite funny um, but now white breaks the symmetry first maybe that's what he thought when he played on g5 i'm um, trying to attack the bishop because now if you go here of course then like the copycat game doesn't work for long instead here instead of knight g5 actually he had queen a4 which perhaps was a better move um the point is to come with the rook to d1 and start attacking this square alongside this bishop putting on putting a lot of pressure but he didn't play this move, Hammer didn't play this move, and he went for uh, knight g5. Now came the queen trade, takes c4, takes c5, so both pawns getting traded. Still a somewhat, theoret the theoretical. Still a somewhat symmetrical position. And now uh, h6, which is a bit overly committal, because you can play other moves and kick away the knight at whatever point you want to, but it's not too bad. You can play rook ac8 first. The point here is after like something like rook a c1. Now you can play h6, get the knight out, and play bishop e6, just get out of any of these shenanigans. And here you have like knight d7, and you should have a reasonable position, very reasonable for black. Probably drawn. Of course, complications remain, but yeah. And here if bishop takes c6, trying to win a pawn, for example this pawn, then you can just play rook e8 and you have some pressure here and you have the bishop pair and as we as we will see in the game actually this is something Amr basically went for um, instead if bishop takes a7 and uh, knight g4 um, I mean if bishop takes a7 occurs now you have knight g4 opening up you have very strong bishops yes you're down a pawn but you have the bishop pair very strong uh, the position is open so this is also quite fine 
Um, instead of all of these complications with rook a c8, there was the mo simpler rook fd8, which aims to trade pieces on the d file. Um, um, of course, there are some co complications after bishop takes c6, but always remember you can sacrifice one of these pawns, whether it's this pawn or this pawn, because you have the bishop pair and can get a lot of activity with the bishop pair. Instead, Amr played h6, which is maybe a questionable decision. Um, it's between interesting and dubious. I gave it an in interesting mark, mostly because I love I love Amr, <laughs> but no. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, it was a bit between that. Rook fd8, knight d2, and bishop a6. There was the possibility of giving up the bishop pair here, but... Yeah, you get to liquidate, you get, you know, like, after knight takes d5, you have knight takes d5 and have a very strong bishop, but uh, <laughs> I love the way Amr played. He's a principled person and loves the bishop pair. So bishop a6. Knight b3 was interesting here. Um, the, the idea is to apply pressure with knight a5 later on the queen side and knight c5 ideas. So that was an in interesting move instead. Hammer's move is very committal. Bishop takes c6, b takes c6, and now bishop takes e7. Again, you're entering into one of these lines where you win the bishop pair, uh, where you uh, win a pawn, but there's the bishop pair for black and they're super active, so here, um, actually black should be completely fine. Rook e8 was played, perhaps rook db8, and after like knight b3 you have knight d5, aiming to liquidate, perhaps that was better, but yeah. Um, rook e8 is still fine, and after bishop takes, bishop takes e3, rook a, b8, so basically I'm not going to analyze every move in detail here. What happened here is that basically Amr had a reasonable position. Of course the problem of this b pawn, of the c pawn, um, is a bit problematic of course, with the rooks potentially bearing down here, but you also have the rook uh, on the b file, so that shouldn't be too big of an issue, right? Um, so... So yeah, so basically, down the pawn, you have the bishop pair, Amr should have a draw, maybe even can play for an edge in some positions. <laughs> so we won't analyze every move in detail, because all of them make sense. Yeah, sorry for that guys, so the video is a bit split now. Um, it's split. <laughs> um, yeah, something happened, and I have to continue from this point. So, Amr's decision here with bishop takes c3, not so good. Um, the point is that he recovers one of the pawns, but it's it turns out that in this position, it's better to be down a pawn with the bishop pair, rather than have equal pawns but playing a bishop versus knight situation. Now I get that usually the bishop versus knight situation usually favors the bishop, especially in kind of more open games like this one, which is more open than closed, I would say, and uh, where you have like a good bishop also, a reasonable bishop after uh, knight takes c4 but the problem is the bishop doesn't have any targets and the weak c pawn alongside this powerful uh, rook d7 move create too many problems instead here it was better to keep the bishop pair but remain down a pawn the point here is that after uh, knight takes c6 rook takes b2 for example knight d5 bishop takes d5 and now you have something like rook e, uh, e4, where you can play rook a4 and try to draw by taking on a2 and just going into this uh, kind of endgame. Or otherwise playing like rook c4, rook c2, you have a lot of active options. So here you are down a pawn here, um, um, but you have very active bishops. Instead, what Amr did with bishop takes c3, and now after knight takes c4, and taking here, sorry, so here... And now taking he, uh, rook b1, okay, you've recovered your pawn, but hello this weakness, hello this weakness, and hello this bishop which is staring into nothing, <laughs> into empty space. So yeah, it was a bit of an unfortunate decision, however still here black is probably drawing this game, but it's very difficult to play now. And Amr was in time trouble as well. So king f1, h5, h4, all of these are reasonable moves. And now Amr blundered by playing a natural move, which is what happens in time trouble. You play natural moves, they turn out to fail for tactical reasons or other reasons. Um, king g7 is natural because you want to activate with king f6 and get the king into the center in the endgame. However, instead a6 was much better because then after rook d7, the rook wouldn't be attacking the a7 pawn. And that turns out to be crucial in this position because after king g7, whoops, 
Rook takes b8. Rook takes b8. Rook d7. Now the a pawn is attacked, and there is no good way to defend it. If you push it, then rook a7. And if you play something rook a8, that's passive, and maybe engine wise it's drawn. I don't know. Uh, I, I would assume not. But maybe. But yeah, so uh, you're playing like this. You can. Yeah, as a human, you're going to lose all of these games. But you have to protect the pawn then again, so I don't know. Amr tried to play more actively, which is more, more principled, of course, playing rook b3, tending rook d3 and taking, of course, taking the knight, but like rook d3 and this check, and trying to go for activity. But uh, Hammer finds a really nice move with king d2, aiming to shoo away the rook with king c2, and that turns out to be just too powerful. Now the a pawn is lost. The a pawn is lost, and yeah, there's no good solution here. Amr further blundered and allowed f3, which is threatening this big mate, um, which can't be really prevented uh, uh, without sacrificing big material. Um, instead, he should have played king d5 here after rook a6 check, but yeah, that doesn't change much. The position remains lost because you're down a pawn, and white simply is too active, and the bishop is stupid, kind of. Especially because it, like it's only duty is guard duty. So yeah, this was uh, a bit of a disappointing game because we were banking on Amr to draw this actually. Especially um, when he had the two bishops, the bishop pair against uh, the knights, even though he was down a pawn. It was very active and looked very good for us. But nope, did not work out. And the third game, now this is the game <laughs> that really had me crying to be honest. Faisal, someone uh, who I know very well, um, super strong player, legend of Lebanese chess, FM, all of that, ex-100 uh, one, time Lebanese champion, a lot of Lebanese championships in his, uh, uh, on his belt, so yeah, very strong player, but here he was outrated by 400 points, 400 points, still, he was completely winning, by which move? By move 8. <laughs> okay, well, he was completely winning by move 9. And w had a much, much better position by move 8. In a very non-standard opening as well. Crazy to think about. Unfortunately, he drew this game. So, again, some spoilers here. But hey, you're going to watch this uh, entire video anyway, right? Hopefully. <laughs> so, the Frenchos. And now B3 going for the Reti Gambit. A favorite of many players actually and actually it scores reasonably well so if you're looking for a nice weapon against the French defense the red deep gambit might be it here Bishop b2 and uh, Faisal uh, very f uh, like he made a very smart decision to complicate matters against his much esteemed opponent because well it got him a winning position that's what you should do against stronger players not go for a draw and try to <laughs> just uh, go for a draw <laughs> And eventually lose. Here, um, actually, an important theoretical point is that knight f6 is, I think, the better move. Yes, it's a gambit, the Reti gambit, and all refutations of gambits start with accepting them, but not always. I think knight f6 is the better move because, while well, it's developing a piece, and you're threatening to take the pawn, and if takes, for example, now you take back, you still have a very reasonable position, sort of coming out like the from 1b3. It's something you'd love to play. You have the bishop, which could, could come out if, uh, if after uh, e takes d5. E takes d5 occurs. You have the bishop on g uh, g4 potentially. The bishop on c8 can come out, and uh, yeah, you just have like active pieces. C5, for example, can come. Out. All of that good stuff. So I think that's uh, probably the better move. D takes e4 just allows white to have a lot of fun, and I'm not even sure there's like a refutation here. Like, okay, you you win a pawn, but. You're going to lose so much time, and like the spawn is weak, so that's one of the main problems in the Reti. You can't develop your bishop, and this bishop can't be developed because, well, it's the French structure. <laughs> so uh, yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of pieces can't be developed, and th and th that proves um, that proved to be uh, Black's downfall. Well, could have proved to be <laughs> Black's downfall. So knight c3. Oh god. So knight c3, knight f6, just defending the pawn, queen e2, attacking the pawn further, and now knight c6, not caring about um, taking here, because taking here is just giving black what they want to, 
Uh, there's also like 94 ideas, but it's just like you're you don't gambit a pawn to win it back. That's so <laughs> anti gambit. You gambit a pawn to gain activity. So how do you gain activity? You castle long. You want to play d3. Open up, attack. Knight d4 was played here, very principled move, just attacking the queen, asking it where it wants to go, and Faisal finds the best move with queen e1. Queen e3 is actually fine, I label it as interesting, it's actually completely fine. Um, now after bishop e7 for example, if you take the pawn, now you probably have to recover the pawn because not much else is happening, and your pieces are better placed. Now there is this knight f5 move which could prove to be annoying, because you have to go to e2 probably, or to d3, both squares, which, uh, like queen d3, okay, you, you're going for an end game. you've recovered the pawn, you can't go for an end game. probably white is better, no, well, not probably, definitely white is better, or slightly better, but, um, yeah, it's not something you want to play as uh, someone who's playing the ratty gambit, and if you go queen e2, I mean, there's the simplicity to draw offer with knight d4, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of weird having the queen here, blocking in the bishop. You might have to play g3, bishop g2 then, which isn't half bad, but yeah. So, queen e3 was an interesting option, but it shouldn't be played probably. Well, not shouldn't be played, but yeah, okay, just play queen e1. Bishop e7 is kind of too lackluster, I would say. Um, the problem is you're setting up yourself for all of these diagonal shenanigans. So maybe better was just to play bishop d7, try to come to c6, though that's not really the main point. Main point probably just keep defending the g7 square and uh, yeah, go from there. Um, it's the bishop e7, d3 now, very principled, opening up. And now one big blunder, or well, at least it's a mistake. Now e5. So, um, e5 opens up for the light squared bishop, I'll give you that. But the problem is it's keeping the queen in the pin, and that's not so nice. Instead, what made more sense was taking, laughter takes, bishop d7. And you can always move the queen to c8, your knight is defending the bishop, so there are no real tricks with, like, bishop b5 or anything like that. Instead, you went for e5, which is questionable for... The the reason we've seen, d takes e4, even knight b5, no, not, not knight b5, because of the d takes e4, and now the further blunder, move 9, a 26, 50 plus GM is losing against um, uh, a 2200 rated player. Okay, of course, Faisal was rated, I think, like 2350 at his peak, but uh, yeah, currently 2200, so that would be a huge upset. And here the crowd was going wild. Oh my god, we're going to win uh, against uh, Norway. Or like we, we could even draw. Like Amr gets a draw, as you've seen. Um, Faisal wins. And like maybe Gio or Antoine can squeeze out a draw. Maybe Gio can squeeze out a draw. We get two points. Two points. That's a match draw. Wow, that would have been great. Didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, so here knight d7 is a big blunder because of the move that Faisal did play. Very nice move, f4. Point is, if you take, you just lose a knight. And the other point is that you're opening up the position. You can take on f3, on e5, develop your knight to f3. All of that good stuff. Knight d7 is just... Uh, like, you have all of these pieces on the d file, and your bishop needs 7 years to come out. Uh, you're underdeveloped. White has all of these nice pieces developed. More are coming on the way. So bad for... Uh, like the the position is so bad instead of knight d7 um uh christiansen should have played um, yeah christiansen uh, christiansen should have played castles after knight b5 this is a pawn sacrifice line which is basically forced queen c7 here white is up a pawn but black has a lot of activity and opposite sides castling so there are some chances for black to draw or even win but of course white remains much better here so white is better. Um, instead, he blundered knight d7, and now f4, bingas on the zungas. Knight c6, <laughs> another blunder. Now I think white is like plus 7 here, or something crazy like that. Um, instead, he should have castled, and after f takes e5, played knight e6. 
Of course, white can play king b1, knight f3, bishop c4, knight e2, just develop the pieces that way. Um, and white is, of course, very much better, but black has some chances here. Uh, well, not many, but uh, some. Knight c6 instead just gives white a free hand with knight d5. Opening up for the monster bishop, opening up this stuff, opening up this stuff, this stuff. The pieces are a ya coming. It's completely lost for black actually. Just look at these pieces. So cramped up, you can't like you can't castle with a good conscience. And if you st stay in the center, you don't have a good conscience. So yeah. <laughs> So black castled and knight f3, very principled move, developing and attacking, e takes f4 and now king b1, a bit meek, maybe just g3 to play queen takes g3 and just mate, maybe that was a bit faster, but you can't blame king b1 as well, very natural move in opposite size casting positions. Now rook e8, again a blunder, bishop d6 was better to prevent this g3 idea. But they both weren't uh, keen on that, so rook e8. Again, g3 was a good move, but knight takes f4 doesn't spoil much. White is still winning. At all of these points, like king b1 here, white was still winning, but yeah, g3 would have made life easier. So knight takes f4, bishop f6, and now a big blunder by Faisal with e5. Um, white is still better, but not winning anymore. Instead of e5, he should have prevented the bishop trade with bishop c1 and followed up with knight h5. Now, having said that, this move is extremely difficult to play. How are you going to like move the pride and joy of your position, Beretti bishop, to c1? Well, you have to avoid the trade, to be honest. I I probably would have played that, but uh, yeah, Faisal can't be faulted at all for not playing it. e5 seems natural, but it's based on a miscalculation. Now, thankfully, uh, Christensen blunders back with bishop takes e5, and now again Faisal is completely winning. But, had he played and found knight c takes e5, Christensen would have um, had... Like, white is still better again, but yeah, he would have been getting closer to withdraw. Here, the way for white to retain the advantage is to play queen g3, where white has still a lot of activity and should be completely fine. But black has... Uh, at least a pawn to show for it and isn't getting mated immediately so they have some chances instead if you go knight takes e5 immediately you run into bishop takes f6 remember the knight is pinned but that doesn't matter because we have mr rook supporting our bishop so bishop takes and now the brilliant queen g5 putting on the pressure and this turns out to be basically a drawn position the reason is a bit of a long long line but it's a forced line so you're losing this, what do you do? You sacrifice the rook here, the exchange, just to not lose this immediately. Now of course if you take here by the way, I just take, you take and hello back rack mate, so don't do that. So bishop takes, and now knight d3 protecting here, f6 trying to win the bishop, and because of the pin, but you get out of that with tempo. The point is if you take, I win your queen, so you can't do that. You try to take with the rook, but now I take with the knight, and yeah, this will just be a drawn endgame. White has a lot of activity to show for the pawn, so it should be about equal. Instead, Christensen went for bishop takes e5, a tragic blunder because after knight takes e5, knight takes queen g3, white just has a huge, huge advantage. You're threatening in some positions, knight h5, h5, bishop takes, takes, and queen takes, and then if knight takes, you have the back rank mate, so that would be a big issue. So I can show that if you want. So here, knight h5, you're threatening mate, you have to go here. This, 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 this. And actually it's mate here because the knight remains on g5, but yeah. So the point stands. Um, here, uh, Christensen went for h6. So here, Faisal is still completely winning, guys, okay? So let me recap here, okay? Here, Faisal played the opening very well. Here he's better after e5. Here he's winning after knight d7. Here he's always winning, always winning. He missed some quicker wins with g3, but still winning. Here he's only better, but okay, he's better. Um, not winning, but still he's better. And uh, had Christensen found knight c takes e5, Faisal would have only been better, but 
he didn't at bishop takes e5 now Faisal is winning 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 all of these are natural moves all of these are winning moves not you can't recapture of course because of mate or capture all very natural 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 and now a draw disappointing disappointing so this so, so disappointing <laughs> Um, I can understand Faisal's reasons. I mean, the team was lost anyway. Um, I think at that point, actually, I was following, of course, but I didn't follow the end of the match very closely. I believe at that point, Faisal was the, was the third to finish, so he had already known they lost. But yeah, he should have played for game points at least, and uh, for himself, get some rating. Now, of course, he didn't want maybe to play on and risk losing i get that of course of course but yeah you you know you don't get these kinds of positions at so quickly against 2650s every day so uh yeah it was uh, a missed opportunity for an upset here christensen was so happy to get the draw instead faisal here could have played on with takes 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 and the liquidation works because of Queen g6 with the idea of bishop d3. Now perhaps Faisal didn't see that, um, so that's why he went for the draw, and that's completely acceptable. But yeah, it leaves a lot like mm, so disappointing. Personally, I feel um, I'm also someone who completely hates draws. I would never go for a draw in this position, especially if my team lost. Um, what's like the draw going to do versus a like? I have good chances to win, I believe, even against the 2650. Uh, I wouldn't care, I would play on. Um, yeah, okay, you get more game points if you draw instead of lose, but how about if you win instead of draw? That also gets you more game points. So yeah. So the key idea here is that bishop d3 is basically an unpreventable mate threat, and black has no good moves here. Um, I think the best move, yeah, is bishop e6, but after takes, bishop f7. You just get into the sand game where you're up a pawn and you have the active rooks. Should be completely winning. Not should be, it's, it's completely winning. So unfortunate, very unfortunate. But hey, what you gotta do? So yeah, this is... Uh, yeah, we were like banking on at least one and a half points. Or maybe even two points, like maybe even drawing Norway, even winning against Norway if like Antoine or uh, Gio could have won. Yeah, didn't work out. Now I'll show you the game, Antoine lost here, so we lost 0 0.5 to 3.5, again, somewhat spoil a spoiler, but hey, yeah, I mean, tough, 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 tough. So let's see here. So we got the Benko Gambit, now I admire Antoine's spirit, full power to him, he played also kind of like Faisal, um, and going for a somewhat, uh, well, of course, the Reti Gambit isn't dubious at all. Maybe only slightly. <laughs> but no, no, it's not. Maybe only slightly. <laughs> but um, of course, because you can gain an advantage against the French with normal lines as well. So the Reti is like uh, at most a draw, maybe even not losing for white. But anyway, so uh, yeah, uh, Antoine here was going for somewhat of a similar strategy, trying to uh, um, befuddle his opponent. Uh, of course, he's outrated by 400 points here, so yeah, it makes sense. But, I don't know. The Banco is very risky. And here Antoine didn't play the best theory, and yeah, he just got completely wiped off the board, unfortunately. Um, C takes B5, A6, the Banco, E3, and E6. Not my favorite move, because you'll see why when you see the game continuation. I just have to say A takes B5 is far better, in my opinion. Um, both are playable, but in my opinion A takes B5 is just simply much better. You'll see why in just a second. I'd see 3, and now you're seeing why, kind of, right? Because now if you take, you're giving uh, white all of that activity, which is what happened actually in the game. And uh, yeah, if you don't take, you're kind of confused what to do with your pieces. At least if you take, you have like the bishop, the knight can develop better. Now you don't have knight A6, for example. So yeah, that's why I don't like it. Um, bishop b7 here was played. 
natural move, I mean, lining up here, trying to take here. But turns out here you can simply take. And after take, now play knight b5. And the idea here is that there's less pressure here. And you're the one who's controlling the tempo of the game. Now white has to respond to your threat. Instead, if you play bishop b7 now, now it's, uh, it's you who has to respond to white's threat. Which could have been d takes e6, f takes e6, and knight f3. This is a very strong positional bind. Black has this weakness, this weakness, this weakness, this weakness. Like all of these are weak squares that can be, of course, attacked. And uh, yeah, this is somewhat of a weak structure. Of course, sometimes you can get d5 and becomes powerful in some cases, but in this case, no. <laughs> Forget about that. Um. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, so yeah, that was a bit of a problem. Uh, so d takes e6 would have been a b uh, like a good move, a bit of a problem for black. But you can also play what uh, what um, um, what uh, Urkedal played. Urkedal, Jorkedal. Sorry, my Norwegian is bad. <laughs> um, yeah, and with e4 you cement the spawn and give black a difficult time. You're threatening in some positions the steamroller, so... Yeah, and here black blundered with a takes b5. Queen a5 is the much more natural move. You want to keep the tension and uh, yeah, just try to open up this way. Uh, whoops. Yeah, try to open up like that. So that. Um, uh, pin the knight. So knight takes e4. If I can draw some arrows. So that would have been better. Instead here he blundered with a takes b5. And you can see here that I have no analysis because there's no way for black to improve. White is a super GM. He played, or at least the GM, um, he played the marvelous game, very, very nice victory. There were no real improvements for black. So we'll just take a look at the demolition job here. So yeah, just to sum up the Benko, you need to know the theory super well. And even then, like, I don't know about playing it against uh, someone like this, especially because on the Norwegian team, do you guys know, Magnus Carlsen, Magnus Carlsen used to play the Benko when he was younger and he used to love it and played it a lot. So I can imagine that kind of knowledge seeped through some uh, Norwegian chess bunkers. So uh, yeah. Bishop d6 was an interesting uh, snake Benoni like maneuver. Probably b queen a5 was the better move but bishop d6 was also fine in the sense that both bishop d6 and queen a5 are losing <laughs> because black has just lost here. Um, uh, yeah you're just down a pawn Black, uh, w uh, white has uh, the extra pawn um, and the more powerful pieces. Yeah, so completely lost. Yeah, so we'll just continue a bit further. All of this is losing, 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 losing. Actually, I can go a bit more slowly for you to see the tactics and appreciate them. So here, Antoine tried to win a pawn, but yeah, after Queen of Three, like uh, here, white was threatening takes and takes. <laughs> with more nasties to come so Antoine defended like maybe even the exchange sacrifice at some point but yeah queen g4 trying to go for this king h8 defending queen h4 you're not defending <laughs> bishop takes h6 is coming and uh, if ever like king h7 well there are lots of good options I guess the simplest would be to take and then play bishop d3 check Probably. So knight a6 uh, and allowing the sacrifice. And now another exchange sacrifice. The point being that now the defense is uh, the defense on g6 on d6 is no longer there. So not really an exchange sacrifice as such. And yeah, this is just over. Rook e5 prevents knight f5, which would lead to mathematique. But now comes knight c4 and another rook, another knight is coming. This is unstoppable. It's gg. Knight f6 is the main threat. G and g. Yeah, so just a very tough game. And the round. <laughs> I'm proud of the Lebanese players. They fought well. They, they proved their might. But just a little bit like uh, some of that in the end. Uh, yeah. So a bit disappointing, but I hope the Lebanese players will be will take a lot of lessons from this round. Um, 
I mean, it bodes well for the future. If they can play like that against 2600s, 2500s, 2700s. Um, actually, I don't know if Hammer ever reached 2700. But yeah, so <laughs> 2500, 2600 players. If they can play like that, well, the the team will perform very well. The importance, uh, the important thing in these events is just to outperform your ranking. Well, maybe philosophically, that's always the important thing when playing chess. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, of course, like we're not <laughs> going to win this or even come in the top 10, top 20. But uh, yeah, we're I think the 86 or 96 seed, so do know. Um, maybe we can, uh, yeah, we can try to improve at least our ranking. So yeah, with that, guys, very long video, but hey, um, quite rich games actually, very, very exciting games on all four boards. So yeah, at least they're playing excite exciting chess, so that bodes well as well. That bodes well as well. Yeah, with that, guys, um, I'll bid you an adieu. I'll bid you adieu. Um, and uh, I guess round two is tomorrow, so also covering that. Stay tuned for more. All right, guys, good luck to the Lebanese team tomorrow, and yeah, take care.